The following presentation is a gift from the team at Streamline Publishing, publishers of Fine Art Connoisseur, Plain Air Magazine, and weekly newsletters Fine Art Today, Realism Today, Plain Air Today, and American Watercolor, and events, the Plain Air Convention and the Figurative Art Convention. We offer over 400 different art instruction tutorials and ultra high quality video by the world's leading artists. If you like what you see, help us support our artists and our team with your purchase. Each video aired has a special discount code for today only in the comments section with a link to the video offered. And to see everything we do, or if you want to receive notice of new releases, new products, and new events for artists, simply click the other link, which says, see everything we do. Thank you. Hi there, I'm Eric Rhodes, publisher and founder of Fine Art Connoisseur and Plant Air Magazines. We're here today and every day at 3 p.m. to help keep you preoccupied with art instead of occupied with all the other craziness going on in the world. We hope it helps. Anyway, uh, we have a really special one today. It's called Luminous Landscapes with the great Lori McNee, and she's going to show you how she paints in water-soluble oils. Enjoy. <music> Okay, hi there, welcome back. And now I'm going to paint more of a summer scene. But I have to tell you, I took this photo in the winter and I mentioned earlier that in Idaho we're having such a mild winter that just a couple hours south of where I live in a ski resort, there's no snow. And I was on the Snake River, everything was green. It was like spring, there were birds and ducks and all kinds of beautiful scenery that was, it, it felt like spring already. So I took some pictures, I did a little study, and if you remember at the beginning of things, I showed you this. So this is what we're gonna be doing today, is this little square painting. I love square paintings, um, you know, and, and they're pretty popular right now because of Instagram. And square is a bit more contemporary. Uh, there's a bit of a contemporary design um, trend going on out there. And so people are liking squares quite a bit. So I paint on squares every now and then, and I think they're a lot of fun. And uh, kind of challenging, but, but I feel like we're gonna get a good painting out of this day. So I'm gonna get going on it. And uh, again, I'm with the water mixable oils, the Cobras, and I will kind of walk you through it again. So I'm looking at my painting, trying to remember exactly what I did here. Um, ba -ba 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 -ba. Okay, so I did Matter Lake, Ultramarine Blue. So as you can tell, I uh, painted on, uh, or I, I toned the painting surface with blue. So it's a cool underpainting and Sometimes I do warm and sometimes cool. It just kind of depends what mood I'm in. But I don't know, I just, I thought this looked really lush. It was um, spring greens going on. And I just wanted, um, well, let me think about where my center point is. We already talked about design. I'm not gonna take time to do that, but here's probably about center. But I'll go ahead and just measure just to be sure. Okay, so 18, so nine. Oh, I'm almost, I'm a little bit below. So there's, there's the center line right in there. So I just wanna make sure, I don't know, I could put, I could put my mountains on there if I want, but oh, I'm gonna go below center. They'll be kinda close, but a little bit below. And then, that's the little bush. I'm going to do kind of a purpley underpainting for fun. And there's my, let's measure just to be sure, because I was off. That's about center, right, right in there. So I just, I don't know, you know what? You could put something right on the center. Let's do it and see what happens. I might move it, but let's just see what happens here. So at this point, I'm using water. So I cleaned my palette. I moved right into this painting after I finished the winter scene, and I cleaned my palette, got fresh water, 
and I didn't lay out new paints. I probably should have added a little bit of paint. I'm going to have to reload in a minute. Um, where am I? Matter Lake, Permanent Green, a little more Matter Lake, a little Ultramarine, and just kind of lightly, I'm scrubbing it in. And my mountain shape, let's see, come up above. I'm almost at center, because there's center. I'm going to drop just slightly below. That's the challenge with these squares. So I'm going to do, I'm going to change things right here a little bit. So you can erase at this point, remember? And I can shrink that down too. Let me see something. I'm looking for the nine right there. So here's, here's the center. So I'm below it still. I could put it on there, but I just don't want to be that symmetrical with the painting. This is still going to look pretty symmetrical as it is, being a square painting, meaning symmetrical as much sky as ground. And something to think about, again, is the concept, the concept of your painting. What are you wanting to say in your painting? What is this painting about? And this painting, for me, is going to be a lot of the sky, primarily. So I've got these little mountains back here. I need to make sure that they fit. I'm going to drop them down. I was going to change it a little bit, but I'm not going to. There, that's going to look better because that was creeping up to the sky too much, and I want this. I want the sky to float, and if I push my ground plane up too high, I'm crowding my sky. I'm already thinking about the shadow that's happening in the water, the reflections, the, the shadow from the, these are willows again, I'm pretty sure. Just light again, there's just a little bit of water on my brush because I just washed them, so I don't need to dip into the water much. This is a pretty straight on shot of the water, so it's pretty easy to just know exactly this comes down like this. So reflections in the water, darks, darks um, reflect lighter in the water and lights reflect darker in the water. So that's just like this funny little thing to remember when you're looking at water and painting reflections. We can talk about that more as I develop all that. But it's a good little tip to keep in mind when painting water. So again, this is kind of a monochromatic painting at first. And let's get some of that ground down below. Just the underpainting of it. Maybe 
warm it up just a tiny bit, make it feel green already. Already starting to look like a landscape, isn't it? Okay. I'll clean this up a little bit. My planes. And I could I could leave them the way they were, but I just want to see my shapes a little more clearly for you. See what I have here. Kind of cut around a little bit. Already thinking about those shapes of the trees or the bushes, actually. Bring that down because that was center line over there. Just push that down a little bit. <clears throat> and there's some light striking the ground plane over here. Maybe these are little sedges on the side of the, the bank. Okay. How pretty that already is. It looks like a, a midnight painting or something right now, you know? We could just leave it like this. Do a nocturne. If it was a nocturne, I would just kind of put some darker tones in here and then I would just have a glow from the horizon. That would, I'm gonna have to try that with this. That's really pretty. Okay, so I'm gonna use the glazing medium like or not glazing, excuse me, quick dry medium, quick dry. The glazing would be last after I painted the whole thing. Um, quick dry medium. And I'm gonna think for a second about ultramarine. Uh, there's my matter lake. And I'm gonna put some white in there, some more blue. And I'm going to tone it down with a little bit of yellow ochre and a little more blue again. I want to blue that off because it's the distant mountain. So let's see how that's looking. It's a little dark, but, but maybe that's okay for the first layer. So I can lighten it when we work. Remember, we work um, dark to light, so. <laughs> it looks like a nocturne. I know I'm painting a transitional time of day, which I love to paint. L I love sunrise and sunset times a day, more drama and beautiful color. And this is kind of an evening painting but it's not technically nocturne and it looks like it right now, but I think it's super cool looking what, what this looks like. So off in the distance, there's like farmer's fields out here. Kind of make that green. Just added a little yellow ochre to that mixture. It's still pretty blue back in there. Bring some across here too.
So I'm just thinking flat right now, and then I'll model and mold as I go. Um, so I washed my brushes and got clean water and get that out of there. And um, I'm going to start from the top down. And I think I'll use this big chip brush just to get started. I'm just going to start laying in the sky a little bit. And I'm just going to kind of have fun with it right now. Just You should have fun all the time anyway. but. So we already have our blue up in there, but that's my underpainting, so I'm covering that now a bit. Dipped into my quick dry. Okay, so started that. I'm going to put a little bit of that same feeling down below in the water just a little bit. Because that water reflects the sky, right? So I'm already kind of reusing that. Now, this would be slightly more muted not as bright because it's a reflection. Remember the, the lights reflect darker and the darks reflect lighter. So I'm already thinking like that. And this is just me painting thinly again right now, just getting it going. And I can adjust things as I go that way. So, all right. I'm going to going to use a little yellow ochre up in here. I have my, I have this kind of following. And my little study over here I'm looking at too. These are kind of wispy cirrus clouds and not maybe a little cumulonimbus off in the distance, but for the most part, these are wispier clouds. So I'm just kind of thinking about the design for a minute. That's looking pretty good. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna pop some cerulean right here at the horizon. Make it a little more colorful. Those are kind of bluffs. They're not really mountains out there on the snake right in there. They're, they're kind of bluffs, meaning cliff-like. So kind of let the organic brushwork help you shape interesting trees and bushes and things. Sky holes and stuff. So I'm already kind of thinking about that. I don't want that looking like a big mitten, but I'll work on that in a minute.
Okay. So when I was here that late evening, or late afternoon, I should say, um, it was just amazing. There were ducks and, and shorebirds singing, and you know, up just two hours up the road where I live, it's all winter up there, and you know, we have chickadees and we have some magpies. Everything's black and white in the winter, it seems like. Uh, but all the colorful songbirds and all the ducks and everybody's gone. There's a couple, we get a few little brave ducks, but for the most part, everybody flies south for the winter and they love this area called Hagerman. Geographically, there's hot springs, thousand, the, the, another name for this Hagerman area is Thousand Springs. And this is where the Native Americans had their wintering grounds in Idaho, on um, the southern area of Idaho. A lot of them would go into these hot springs and, and winter there. Just beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. Our family has a little farm, and uh, it, so I'm able to go down and visit. But um, the ducks and the geese and shorebirds and upland game birds love it here. And that afternoon, which was probably uh, probably around 5.30 in the afternoon when I went there um, and got pictures and a little quick study. Uh, it was just a magical time of day and all the birds were singing and but it's funny because it, it looks like a summer scene but it's actually early spring. But I love early spring with the beautiful colors and fresh baby greens. I'm putting a little bit of um, permanent green on the horizon. It's pretty. A little alizarin in here, just kind of making these clouds and the late afternoon sun on these clouds. The clouds, even though they have a lot of drama to them and they look like there could be maybe a storm on the horizon or something going on, they're still going to be lighter than the ground plane. So you want them to float. And if you make your values too dark in the sky, your, your clouds aren't going to be believable like they're floating. You know, you want them to have he heavy little underbellies because they might be full of the shadow and some rain inside of them. But you still want them to float. The clouds reflect whatever color is bouncing up. There's a little bit of that color in the base, in the belly of a cloud, so just a little bit. You know, it can kind of drag a little bit of that green. There's a little bit of that purple, but it just kind of helps make those clouds have some form and shape and volume, because you want to feel the weight of the cloud, but still, feel like it's floating. Not the weight of it as much as just the volume of it, just voluptuous clouds. So, so that kind of helps it feel like it has some form. So let's get a little yellow up in there. I'm painting with a pretty small brush right now. I don't know why I am, but I'm going to stop in a minute. So natural harmonies are purples and yellows, so that's really pretty and pleasing to the eye. I just want the painting to be pretty and uh, just like a beautiful moment in time that you happened upon, which is really what happened. Again, I was just driving from our ranch, farm, 
we have a fruit farm down there, and uh, it's organic. And we actually have the only citrus in Idaho that I know of. We have two big citrus um, greenhouses, giant greenhouses, where we grow Meyer lemons and uh, grapefruits and tangelos and all kinds of yummy things. And so I had been down there kind of getting out of the winter at home, the cold. Even though it's been, a, like I said, a pretty mild winter, it's still cold. Um, so I had gone and visited the farm, and I get to drive past this every day. But again, my favorite time of day to, to go on these road trips are the transitional times of day, and that's when the animals like it best, too. So there were deer out in the meadows and out in the farmer's fields, and it was just really spectacular. Okay, I'm going to bring a little bit more. How did I make that minty color? I've got this minty color in this painting. And I think I mixed some of this. And, well, let's just see what, maybe it's only that. Maybe it was just green. I'm going to kind of let some of that sparkle, that canvas sparkle through. Sometimes it's fun to leave a little bit of the history of the painting. It's interesting, um, like if the sun w was setting, it's um, something to keep in mind is the sky's a bit, you know, of course it arcs like so. and you know, the top being the bluest part of the sky and on down as the sun is setting. And it's a bit like the rainbow. So if the sun was to be setting right here, the edge of the horizon would have a little line of red and then orange and yellow, green, blue, purple, indigo, violet, kind of variations of that. I mean, so when you're out there watching the sunset, Look for that next time and see if you can kind of start to see those layers of the rainbow just very subtle and they melt together and it's so beautiful. But it helps you understand how to portray the sky at that transitional time of day. Right now, I'm, it's, this was a little earlier than that, so I had all kinds of light bouncing all around. So, and again, I'm working with this photograph and this little study that I did. Let's see how it goes. Clouds, again, are very organic, and they're never perfect. And, and so we're just, with paint, doing our best to, to simulate nature. Maybe that's a little of the sky po popping through in there. Love that. Looks like it's a little too orange. I just want a little hint. I just want a little hint of um, some warmth, like the the it's reflecting a little bit from the ground. Earth. Earth to Lori. Don't want everything 
horizontal, even though these clouds kind of float across the sky horizontally, breaking up that. Trying to make it interesting. I'm going to warm this up in here because that's a little bit of that setting sun starting to happen in the late afternoon. So there's a little bit of that red, orange, yellow happening. At least that's what I remember. It's looking pretty. Okay, so now we're breaking up this hard line. You know, if you wanted it to be kind of postery style, you wouldn't have to break that up. And some artists like that, and sometimes I do. I've painted and left these harder lines, and I'm a fan of Maynard Dixon, and he left those edges in a lot. And it really worked. It really gives you that feeling of the Old West. I love it. Okay, so we're just kind of working our way down this linen canvas. And let's see. So we have a farmer's field off in the distance there. Maybe it's getting a little dark. I'm going to lighten it up just a little bit. And I just painted a closer field. I like all the, I love flying and looking down at the farmer's fields. I think they're so cool. All the geometrical patterns and I'm always in awe when I'm up there looking down at our world. Be cool to paint that. Plein air paint, 30,000 feet. Wonder if anyone's ever done that. That would be awesome. Okay, so let me see something I just did. Hmm, so I need to lighten my clouds because my ground got, my ground got, and I can darken my uh, ground a little bit, but my clouds I think are too dark. After I gave you the big cloud lesson, they got dark. So I'm just kind of dragging a little bit of white over them. Not too worried about it. Just lifting the value a little bit. At the same time, it is toning them down some. Let's bring a couple 
highlights back in. that sit for a minute and see what happens. Um, I'm going to lighten my hills back in here just a little bit. Kind of model them just a little bit. They're going to be a little lighter on top where the sky's striking them. base of them a little bit darker, just to have them anchored into the ground a bit. Sometimes mountains, there's atmosphere down here that, like a veil, but I'm not going to do that right now. I'm going to leave them like this. Okay, so I'm going to mix. So green, um, as I like having two greens on my palette if I am not mixing them. And the permanent green is cooler, and the sap green, green is warmer. And so for the illusion of green, painting grass and things, we can use the warmer green coming toward us and the cooler green going away from us. So I'm going to kind of play back and forth with a couple greens. And I could mix them myself, but. I'm not going to today. Kind of breaking up these lines now. And I can come back in if I need to. But that's looking pretty. And and I can use palette knife if I want. And again, I'm using the quick dry and some of the painting paste right now. That makes it pretty and kind of lush feeling. A little bit of the blue sparkling through still. Normally when I paint um, summer scenes, I oftentimes, I shouldn't say normally, but I oftentimes tone with a burnt sienna or something like that because the earth, the, the earth is, um, you know, that tone. And then you put the green over the top and it automatically makes it feel like the ground's kind of sparkling through the grass. But Again, I just really liked starting with a blue underpainting on this. It makes it feel real lush. So I'm going to work on, um, on these bushes for a minute. So the photo is really dark. I'm going to, I know that it's not that dark in real life. So. Going to shift this to be not so dark. I'm going to still kind of have this purpley green under here. I'm going to do permanent green and some alizarin. I'm looking at my little piece that I painted, my little study, because the tones of it are much better than the picture that I have, the image. And again, that's why I really believe in getting out and painting. Makes a huge difference. So I like to mass link, um, link masses, I should say. And these three are not exactly linked. So I'm going to kind of bring these two a little closer together so that it's not like just dot, dot, dot.
And then um, this line here kind of helps connect things, like a shadow, a line in the grass, whatever it is, makes it not look disjointed. So you can see I use some of the same color, mix it and put it up in the tree and up in the bush or whatever and then back down. And that's how I work. I'm using this kind of purpley green mixture. I had more of a purple mixture for my first lay-in and now I'm bringing a little more of the green over the top. Still pretty thin, keeping them transparent. I could go a little more opaque, but I don't know. I'm kind of liking this right now. And with reflections, just start opposing strokes like that. coming. It's coming together. Okay, so I'm going to keep I'm going to keep moving. Let's get this. I'm going to darken this down here a little bit more. These are going to be some front grasses and things like this. And these almost kind of just overlapped here. That's looking better. I'm gonna, I don't want my eye running off over there, so I'm didn't, gonna do that. Okay, so let's work on those trees or those bushes again. And I think I'm gonna dip into my cold wax medium again. I could use the, the paste, but I'm gonna use a little bit of this. Where's my, here it is, hiding from me. Okay, and just put a blob of it out there. Put the lid back on so you're not breathing it, because it's odorless mineral spirits is what this is made out of, but um, you're still, you still don't wanna breathe it. And you don't want it on your hands either. And earlier I talked about wearing gloves generally, but I'm not today. So I've got some of the um, medium here still, the quick dry, which is fine because everything works together. I have had really good luck over the years. But you, okay, so see, this is not water mixable, but again, it works. It, it works with water, it works with the mediums, and I've had good luck with it. So. You can give it a try too. Okay, so I'm gonna just start making these look a little more green instead of purple. Kind of an olive green. And they were pretty dark. I'm starting dark and then I'll lighten them up, especially up toward where the, the light's hitting the tops of them. I'm gonna, that, that got too chalky. So i just go back and add a little more purpley color. There it goes decided to run run this one off like I did in that painting to break up, make it interesting compared to the other side. Okay, let those sit for a minute. Okay, I'm gonna 
going to use this brush again. want those edges soft against the sky. Make them feel like leaves and things blowing in the wind a little bit. And then I'm going to cut back the sky again. Bear with me. Great painters have long discovered that a painting cannot just be a representation of a scene. It needs to be a representation of a mood, the feeling the artist experienced in the place. And it is that mood which speaks to those who want the painting hanging on their wall. But how do you create mood? How do you make your paintings feel luminous? It comes down to many things, the right feel of the sky, the atmosphere in the distance, the edges of the trees, the right colors, and the way the light hits the land. Now, artist Lori McNee will show you her process to make paintings luminous. In this all new art instruction video, Lori shows you her complete process from start to finish on how to produce amazing landscape paintings yourself. You will learn how to paint a summer landscape. How to paint a winter landscape, which is a lot different. A lesson in painting clouds, which are an essential part of most landscape scenes. An easy way to bring shadows to life. How to improve twigs and foliage. And one thing to keep your paintings from looking fake. Plus a whole lot more. And there's also an unexpected bonus you'll discover how to use water mixable oil paints. And though this landscape painting process can be done with oils, acrylics, or water mixable oils, learning to paint with water mixable oils will come in handy if you want to travel to distant lands, knowing you can't fly with turpentine, or maybe you just want the fumes out of your life. Most who have tried them are using them wrong, which results in sticky paint. Learn to use them properly. No matter if you paint as a hobby or you paint as a profession, you're in for a treat because Lori effectively breaks down her entire landscape painting process on this new video. Lori McNeese, Luminous Landscape Painting with Water Mixable Oils, now available on either DVD or streaming video. Order yours today. Well, that is Lori McNee, and she's painting in water-soluble oils. The video is called Luminous Landscapes, and you can learn more about it at lilyartvideo.com. And we have a special discount code for you. It's in the comments section to be used for today only. Now, let's get right to our interview with Lori McNee. Hi, I'm Eric Rhodes with Fine Art Connoisseur and Plein Air Magazine. We're here today with Lori McNee. Lori, welcome. Hi, thanks for having me. We haven't caught up in a long time, so we had you in the studio three, four years ago. Three, three years, years ago. Three years, almost to the date. And we did, a, uh, we did a video together on social media marketing. That's right. And of course, everything we taught has now changed. Not everything. Not everything? But probably 60%, yeah. 65, yeah. So I know we're not here to talk about that, but are you still pretty actively involved in the whole social media thing? You know, I'm keeping my finger on the pulse and I'm still blogging. I love blogging and that's primarily how I got involved in social media anyway, was a way to get my message out to the public. And um, you know, you write a blog post, you post an image of your art and then what happens to it? And so that's when I discovered Twitter and just took off right away. That was what, 10 years ago now? And so I got on the cutting edge of that, as you know and just took off to where at one point I ended up being one of the top 100 women in the world on Twitter. And you know, I've been featured in all kinds of the Huffington Post, the Wall Street Journal, all kinds of fun things have happened because of that. I would be on the red carpet with the Grammys and the Oscars and tweeting live events. Um, so that was all really a great adventure. However, I had to kind of make a choice. Am I going to be this social media person or am I going to be a painter? And my first love is my art. Now I do love that other side of the business, 
but I've had to make some choices and so I've pared back on that a little bit and as you just said, it changes so quickly that I can't just rest on my laurels. I have to keep up with it and it was too consuming. So I've backed off a little bit. This, this is an issue for a lot of artists now because artists are getting seduced by so many things. They're getting seduced by social media, by, by marketing. Of course, they have to do marketing if, if they're selling their own work. And they're getting seduced by all these other things like teaching and creating their own videos and, and things like right. that. And ultimately, if you don't get down to painting and you don't focus on your artwork, you're going to be finding yourself in a completely different place at some point. It's true, you have nothing to promote <laughs> if you're not painting. But it's a two-edged sword, it is, and um, unless you're one of the top, top, top artists out there, you kind of have to do some self-promoting. It's just part of the business nowadays. Well, uh, the key essentials in marketing always work no matter what uh, tool you're using, whether it's Instagram or Facebook or traditional advertising or other things, there's still things that you have to put into place. So I didn't intend for this to be a marketing <laughs> conversation, yeah. but you're really good at it. Yeah. What, what are the tenets that you kind of follow to keep yourself out there? You're doing blogging. Right. What else are you doing to kind of make sure that people are knowing that you're out there, knowing that you've got these events that you're doing and so on? Right, so I'm blogging and then I get my message out via Twitter. Facebook, I still have a Facebook fan page, uh, business page basically, and uh, connect with um, my following and answer comments and that sort of thing. And then Instagram, um, Instagram, I'm, I was a little slower adopter. I've been on Instagram, but I kind of wasn't really into it. And I'm seeing a lot of traction happen for my fellow artists, so I'm starting to put more effort into Instagram. I like Pinterest too, people forget about Pinterest. Those pins sit there and they just go viral. And so Pinterest is a really great way to get traffic back to your website or blog. Yeah. So YouTube, I haven't done YouTube for a while, but um, I, that's on my to-do list for 2018 is to do more YouTube videos. So I wanna back all the way to the beginning. Okay. You're probably a little girl. When did this whole idea of becoming an artist hit you? So I grew up in Scottsdale. I was born in LA, but when I was a baby, they moved us to Scottsdale. And uh, we had a home in an old orange grove. And back in the day, they used to, back in the, the old days already, oh no. <laughs> <laughs> they used to irrigate the lawns. And I don't know if they do that anymore there. Now we have sprinkler systems for the most part, but irrigation is once a week, they'd come in and they'd flood the front yard. And to me, as a little girl, it felt like it was three feet deep, but it was probably only about six inches of water. But when the water receded, all these beautiful birds would flock to our yard with the oranges and everything going on. It was just, it, it was um, a little slice of paradise. And I would be out there trying to capture these birds that were flocking to the yard. And uh, I made traps and then my parents played tricks on me and, and said, hey, if you sprinkle salt on a bird's tail, they can't fly. Do you remember that old yeah, wives' yeah, tale? Yeah. So my folks would give us little salt shakers and watch my sister and myself chase these birds. It never worked, so I got frustrated. My parents gave me pencil and paper and I started capturing them on paper. Around five, I started really drawing. Wow, and you're still doing birds today. I still do, yeah. yeah. So in doing so, because people say, why do you add birds to your still life painting? And uh, a couple reasons. Um, first of all, I you know, really admire the Dutch painters and they used a lot of natural ob objects in their still life, the birds and feathers and butterflies and nests and things. So kind of from that genre I borrow from and put a little more of a modern day twist on it. But as a little girl, um, saving birds that used to hit the window and that sort of thing, I used to nurse them back to health and, and usually they'd fly away. But every now and then I'd have one that I'd have to take to the bird lady and she was this little elderly woman and she would um, resuscitate and revive birds and let them go again. So this one time I went in there with a little sparrow or something and um, she had a hummingbird that was injured and I love hummingbirds and it was sitting on a bouquet of flowers, flowers and she'd feed it nectar but it couldn't fly because it had a broken wing but it was on a bouquet of flowers. So. When I started adding birds to my still life paintings, I realized it was like this latent memory way back in there that kind of kind of came up, bubbled up. And so that's where that's coming from. Something that you really love, something yes, you're passionate yes. about. And I know them really well because I went 
from painting birds, um, just drawing birds, excuse me, to painting birds uh, when I became a young mom. I still wanted to pursue my art career. So between loads of laundry and during nap time, and I'd step till three in the morning, I uh, was a wildlife art artist. This was back in the 80s, and I painted with acrylics primarily back then. And to stay motivated and inspired, I would enter duck stamps and trout stamp competitions and things. And I painted for Ducks Unlimited and Nature Conservancy, and that's kind of how I got started. I never won, but I did get second and third and honorable mention a well, few times. Oh, that's pretty good. So that was pretty good, yeah. and even in Ohio. And Ohio's one of the toughest states. But I got really tired of counting feathers because you have to be very realistic and those good old boys count those feathers and they know they're ducks. And so I kind of got tired of, of being that ultra realistic. And so then I discovered oils and loosened up a bit. So did you have any formal training of any kind? You know, um, I took art in school, in high school and then in college. And I don't think really that I learned much about painting in college, but I did learn how to render. I had a really good drawing teacher mm -hmm. and I ran into her a few years back and it was really fun to realize that Irina Gromborg was um, still drawing and uh, she's an artist. I think she's in Southern California still, but um, she meant a lot to me in my drawing career, which turned into painting. So you were raising kids. Yes. And three try, kids. Three kids, mm -hmm. three boys? Boy, girl, boy. Boy, girl, boy. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you're raising your kids, you're trying to paint in between being a mom, which yes. is tough duty. Yes. And then was there a kind of a transitional moment where, was it when the kids got older? Was it when the kids left? These are good questions. So, um, so in the 80s when I was doing my drawing and my painting and illustrating, I for a short time was in Neyland Gallery and they represent me now and this was in the late 80s but I just didn't have the time to really um, produce. It was a little bit too soon for me to be in the gallery. So I pulled out until uh, 2000 and what happened is I was saying I was in this wildlife art world which kind of waned by the late 90s, it, it just kind of was falling out of favor. I was getting bored with a, acrylic paint. And so, so we're <laughs> obviously the collectors. <laughs> exactly, <laughs> I know, I know. But I just honestly, like I said, I was ready to tr explore and try something new. So I started painting it with oils and I grabbed Kevin McPherson's book. Mm -hmm. um, what's the name of it? Um, you know, the plein air one. Yeah, yeah, I know the something book. Something about light, I'm sorry, Kevin. Kevin, yeah. I'm sorry. Painting color and light. Yes, that's it. So anyway, but I love your book, um, and so he challenged the reader to do little six by eights, and I can't remember, maybe a hundred, something right. like that, do a hundred. So I decided this one summer, while I'm driving my kids to soccer and ice skating and hockey and all that kind of stuff, while they're at their sport, I'm gonna sit outside my car, and instead of watching them, I'm gonna paint one little painting. And that's what I did. I did quick little paintings a day, just one a day the whole summer. By the end of summer, I don't know that I had 100, but I probably had about 90-ish. And I had a girlfriend over to my house one day, and she came into my studio and she said, my gosh, Lori, where'd these come from? Oh my goodness, you know? And she said, these are really good. I said, thanks. She goes, can I show them? I said, well, where do you want to show them? So she had a really upper scale consign consignment store called Revival. And she said, I want you to frame them up and we're gonna have a show for you. So I framed them all up and in doing so, I also did a few still of my very first still life paintings. And I, I did a few still life paintings kinda a la David LaFell type, you know. Had his book too. And, um, and I worked with Joanne Arnett, who is a dear friend of mine, and uh, she, she's a mentor of mine. And so I was uh, producing some decent still life already. And this one still life I added a bird to, a little chickadee. So anyway, I had this um, show, almost everything sold, and the chickadee as well, the, the still life with the chickadee. And down the road was Neyland Gallery, and I decided one day, I'm gonna go down there and ask the director to come look at my show, which I did. So I went and I grabbed Carrie, who's still the director there, and I said, would you mind when you have a break, just come by a couple blocks down the road, go peek at what I'm doing. 
So she did, and I got a phone call, and she said, I want you back. I want to show you. Oh, wonderful. Um, it was great, and, and the rest is history, and they've been such an important part of my art career. Well, one thing that you, you did there is that you went out of your way and you asked somebody for some, some help. Come look at my work. That's something a lot of artists just are afraid to do. That's right. So how do you get up the courage to do that? Well, you have to take charge of your art career. People aren't going to come to you. You have to generally go to them. Every now and then, if you're advertising and you're out there being seen, someone might call you up and invite you to do something, show in a gallery or whatever. But I knew that I needed to, again, take charge of my career. And uh, I just had the courage. And I went in. And the worst thing that's going to happen is they're going to say, no, thank you. And I know that the one thing about galleries that I've learned is that even if they say they're full, and we're not taking new artists, they're always, always going to take somebody that has a, a, a new voice, a new vision, and that they know they can sell. So there's always room. They're, they're a business to make money. They're in business to make money. We all have these little voices in our head. Yes. Do you have those? Do you have, because you seem like such a positive person. Do you have those little negative voices that are constantly telling you, no, you're not good enough, you can't do this? Yes. Of course, of course. I just, it's the monkey brain, the chatter, and I just have really been learning how to not listen to that. To that. It's just thoughts. Thoughts aren't, you know, yes, thoughts are things because we think something and then we make it happen. However, just because you're thinking it doesn't make it real, you know? And I really believe that. Yeah, well, it's hard to get over sometimes, isn't it? It is. It's an ongoing journey. So why do you do this? What is this art thing about for you? Why do you paint? That's a good question and uh, I it just is kind of who I feel like I've always been. I've always wanted to interpret nature, interpret what I'm seeing in my own language um, in a poetic way. I strive to help in my small way make the world a better place. You know, um, paintings are windows to the imagination is how I see it. When you hang a painting up in someone's home they are buying a piece of the artist, a little bit of their soul, and you're transporting someone's imagination. You know, we can look out a window and do the same thing, but, but art is soulful and deep, and, and I, I strive to uh, paint paintings that have a story meaning for them. So what happened once you got into the Neyland Gallery for the second time? Mm -hmm. What happened to your career from that point forward? Well... They, it really boosted it, my career. Uh, I had a show right away. It was over Memorial Weekend, and they put me out in the front, and I was kind of the flavor of the month in town, so to speak. I live in a small town, um, Sun Valley, Idaho. It's a beautiful resort town. Love it. Um, and, you know, everybody wanted a Lori McNee. <laughs> so it went really well. And this was before the market kind of changed, as we all know. Mm -hmm. And so I, I really did really well. And then from there, I, they would advertise with me. We would um, go in on ads. And I got discovered by a couple other galleries out there that saw my ads in magazines. And I branched out into other marketplaces. And I'm still out in those galleries doing really well. I have very good um, relationships with my galleries. Uh, we're like family. So how do you do that? What, what's the tip for everybody watching in terms of how to have a proper relationship with a gallery? Uh, communication, just like any relationship, it's a relationship. And uh, just uh, um, sharing how you feel about something, back and forth, open, honesty, transparency, mm -hmm. uh, especially in this day and age, the digital day and age where we're all posting our images and you know, sometimes selling things off the internet. Have that open dialogue and, and know what the boundaries are, like just with any relationship. You don't want to cheat on somebody. You know, where, where are you going to go with it? So that, that's the most important tip, I would say. And give them a good product, too. You know, work hard for them. When do you, when do you know when a painting is done? That is um, an age-old question for artists, isn't it? Um, it's honestly never done, right? It's the journey, not the destination. But I was telling a joke um, just to the cameraman while we were painting, actually, that it takes two to paint a painting one to paint it and the other one is standing behind the painter with an axe telling them when to stop because that's kind of what happens. Um, if I really get stuck, I'll ask the opinion of somebody, maybe one of my kids who really isn't an artist and they come in and they're very frank with me. Or I have a couple good girlfriends that I'll 
we email images back and forth and uh, we help each other out that way. I have a couple of people that I will email images to and they will see things that I can't see because I've been working it too much. It's true. We get too close to our work sometimes. It's good to step away. And that's why I like to take breaks as I'm painting too. And I'll go hike a mountain or take my dogs for a walk or go get coffee with a friend and come back and you get a fresh perspective. And it's kind of nice not to have to rush, but when you're cramming for a show, sometimes you don't have that luxury. And so some paintings go to the galleries when you wonder if they're finished. And, and uh, so uh, luckily one of my galleries is in my hometown, Neelan Gallery, and I'm able to go in sometimes and take my little, my little touch-up kit with me and tweak things. Now, do you ever go into the gallery and, and wish that you could just completely rip it off the wall or take it down or burn it? <laughs> I have some of those pieces in my house, in my studio. Um, not so much anymore. When I first was out there professionally, I would say, uh, especially in retrospect, I look back at older work and, and sometimes um, I wish I had a chance to take a brush back to it. But I'm putting out work that I'm pretty proud of now. Every now and then there's an ugly duckling, but usually it's pretty, pretty good. I'm proud of it. How much teaching do you do? So that's a part of my... Um, business career that's uh, really taking off right now. Um, not tons, but probably two local a year, and then I've been doing two to three abroads a year. So I'm really enjoying that. So it's, these are workshops? Yes, they're workshops. Uh -huh. and, and what are the common problems that you're finding among painters who are taking the workshops? What things do you instantly see that are problems that they're typically having that people need to really work on? Um, they don't understand design, first of all. Um, they don't understand their values. They have too many values. Um, they're not linking masses. And another thing is they, they muddy up the color a bit. They're mixing, they're dipping into white too quickly. You know, they're not laying in their darks and kind of leaving them and then building up from there. They're dipping into white and so things get chalky or muddy very quickly. What are some of the principles of design that are important? I know it's kind of hard to talk people through it rather than show them, but what kinds of things do you try to get people to think about? Oh, just um, having that, the flow through a painting to allow the viewer to have a way in and out of a, especially for a landscape, to move in and out, and linking masses together, um, not just having darks kind of dotted all over or lights dotted all over, kind of think about um, the way the, the the, they're, it, concept, design, value, uh, they're all linked together. It's kind of all part of the same thing, you know, mm -hmm. the composition. Um, so those mm -hmm. are the things that I work toward, uh, teaching them how to maybe use the edges and have a focal point, that sort of thing. Okay. What are they trying to say in the painting? So a hundred years from now, when possibly you're gone, maybe technology will change <laughs> and you're not gone, but what is something that if somebody really researched you as an artist, they would never find that you could tell us about right now? Um, if they x-ray one of my paintings, they're gonna find other ones underneath. <laughs> 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 it happens quite a bit. If something doesn't sell, I take it home and I look at it and oftentimes I'll paint over it and usually those sell. Do you have a technique for something that doesn't sell? A technique. I kind of feel like I've learned from what I was trying to say and I can, sometimes I really like painting on a, an older oil painting and I just re use retouch varnish to kind of reactivate it and uh, paint over the top and it generally really goes quickly and, and it just, I, it, it works. It's repurposing something that didn't work in the first time, so. We know about Laurie McNee, the artist, what about Laurie McNee, the other person, the mom, the adventurer? Tell us a little bit about your life. What, what is something we might not otherwise learn about? So I, I love so many things and I feel like life is one big adventure. And so that's one reason why I'm enjoying teaching these workshops abroad because they're taking me to other countries that I can explore in the name of work. But besides that, I, I love um, skiing. I, uh, and every, but everything's a painting for me, no matter what I'm doing. Even if I'm out there just having fun without thinking of working, I'm, I'm totally adding to my storehouse of knowledge. And I'm inspired, I take my camera with me, but I love hiking mountains. 
I love travel, as I said. I enjoy family a lot and spending time with friends. So do you ever go outdoors and do snow paintings? I sure do. In fact, I, um, there's a sport called um, backcountry skiing. Yeah. And it's where you hike with skins on the bottom. It's, they're not real skins anymore. Back in the old days it was. Now it's kind of a velour type thing, so it grips the snow. And so you hike up, and I'll carry my paints on my back and I'll hike up in the, in the snow and uh, paint a little painting and ski down. I do that quite a bit. I you're enjoy brave. It. I, I have fun. I like challenging myself. So you're using water-based oils. I am. And I am. when you're outdoors in freezing weather, how does that fare? So they freeze. And so that's been a little challenge. And, and uh, I actually have struggled with that. In fact, I was on the phone with them, Royal Talents, because I love the Cobra paints. I love them, and I use them all the time. Big advocate, however, when <laughs> painting in freezing temperatures, they freeze. So I was Googling all about it, and some people are saying, well, just add vodka or gin to your water, you know? And I called Kyle, and he said, nope, nope, you can't do that. It won't be archivally sound. So what he said is to take a, a thermos with hot water, keep that by your side, um, and then um, use the painting medium instead the painting medium will not freeze so you just don't use water just use the water to rinse off your brushes dry them off really well and then uh, add the painting medium instead of water and so i'm excited to try that because apparently it's still below freezing at home so i'm going to be able to have some time this winter to test that out vodka sounds like more fun <laughs> <I know. laughs> exactly that's what the russians do keep that on the side right the russians mix <laughs> vodka into their white i've heard that yes yeah, because but the white gets really stiff. I know, but that I guess uh, that's not a good thing to do. I guess not. So <laughs> <laughs> now tell us how we can find out about uh, your other artwork. How can we find out about your workshops? Oh, thanks. So my blog is finearttips.com, and it's there's so much. Um, I I think I have written over 500 articles, and some of and, and I only blog probably once a month now, but some of the most um, notable artists in our day and age have added tips and that sort of thing. There's a lot of great, it's a very, you know, you have to go digging for treasure on my blog. It's fun. Okay. Um, that's one thing. It's a good resource and you can find out more about me there. And then my uh, website's linking to my blog and that's lorimcnee.com. L-O-R-I. L-O-R-I, yes. McNee. McNee. M-C-N-E-E. -E. Well, this has been fun. Thank you for coming in. Thanks, Eric. Thanks for having me. Well, that is Laurie McNee, and the video is called Luminous Landscapes. And you can learn more about the full course at lilyartvideo.com. Remember, there's a special discount code in the comments section. Hope you enjoyed it. We'll be here tomorrow at 3 Eastern. We also have for you a video. It's worth $107. It's called 97 Amazing Painting Secrets from the World's Leading Masters. It's two hours long, and it's yours free at 97tips.com. Thanks for watching. I'll see you tomorrow. I'm Eric Rhodes.
Great painters have long discovered that a painting cannot just be a representation of a scene. It needs to be a representation of a mood, the feeling the artist experienced in the place. And it is that mood which speaks to those who want the painting hanging on their wall. But how do you create mood? How do you make your paintings feel luminous? It comes down to many things. The right feel of the sky, the atmosphere in the distance, the edges of the trees, the right colors, and the way the light hits the land. Now, artist Lori McNee will show you her process to make paintings luminous. In this all new art instruction video, Lori shows you her complete process from start to finish on how to produce amazing landscape paintings yourself. You will learn how to paint a summer landscape, how to paint a winter landscape, which is a lot different, a lesson in painting clouds, which are an essential part of most landscape scenes, an easy way to bring shadows to life, how to improve twigs and foliage, and one thing to keep your paintings from looking fake, plus a whole lot more. And there's also an unexpected bonus. You'll discover how to use water mixable oil paints. And though this landscape painting process can be done with oils, acrylics, or water mixable oils, learning to paint with water mixable oils will come in handy if you want to travel to distant lands, knowing you can't fly with turpentine, or maybe you just want the fumes out of your life. Most who have tried them are using them wrong, which results in sticky paint. Learn to use them properly. No matter if you paint as a hobby or you paint as a profession, you're in for a treat because Lori effectively breaks down her entire landscape painting process on this new video. Lori McNeese, Luminous Landscape Painting with Water Mixable Oils, now available on either DVD or streaming video. Order yours today.